Well, I want to start with today is for the residents in the room, just a quick case to see what our perception is with dealing with trauma, and then we'll discuss the literature and sort of the ways we're evolving right now. So in Canada and Ontario, we tend to see a lot more blunt than penetrating injuries. So the case is going to be a very simple blunt trauma injury. You have this gentleman who has decided to fix the car by himself, and it sort of, you know, rolls off its edge and crushes him. And he comes to the eMERGE, he sees our wonderful eMERGE docs, always looking professional and helpful. And you get paged as part of the trauma team. What you're told is you have a 30 year old male who has been crushed by a car. He was working underneath the car on the frame and the car rolled over crushing his ab abdomen and his legs. His vials are seen here. He's tachycardic, he's hypotensive, his respirator is 26, setting 85% on room air at this point in time, his temperature is 36.8. That being said, his GCS is 14, he's moving all of his limbs, he appears quite anxious. He has the usual EMS setup, which means he's got a C-spine collar on, they're trying to hook up the NRB, and you see obvious bruisings to his chest, abdomen, deformed lower extremities, and no obvious external bleeding. Question to you guys is what do you want to do now? So airways protected, SAS are low. Um, I, I would too, though. Rapid sequence intubation, I would use uh, Atomidate and Rock. Where are you going to do both circulation? So he's hypotensive. Uh, make sure he has uh, two uh, um, 14 or 16 gauge antiviral IVs. Okay, he has those. Um, and then I would give him a leader for storage. Okay. So let's say you do all of that, and after intubating, his map drops to 40. What do you want to do now? You're giving them the one leader. Um, so I'm concerned that he might be bleeding, so I'd call for some uh, uncrossed uh, match blood. Okay, uncrossed match blood is going to be five minutes. What do you want to do right now? I would give him another leader of the appointment. Okay, so while you're doing this, one of your colleagues does a fast on him. If you look just at the edge of the spleen, you notice some dark area. So what do you make of this? His map is 40. What does this man need? So he's hypotensive with a positive fast. So he needs a pop on. Good. So throughout this entire case, despite giving the extra liter of fluids, you've given him two liters of crystalloid, his map never rises above 70 and he heads to the OR and goes from there. He does end up surviving to the ICU, at which point he does bleed out in Bay 5. So the question we have is damage control resuscitation. How do we do it properly? And the ethos we're using is when less is more. So back in the 1920s, they actually had this idea, a surgeon in the World War, said that hemorrhage in the case of shock may not have occurred to such a marked degree because blood pressure had been too low and they couldn't have forced the clot off with raising the blood pressure too soon before a surgeon gets in there, you're making people bleed more and you're killing them. So that's what they said a little under 100 years ago. We have changed that and pound people with fluid. We do that because we realize that shock kills people. As such, we started to move towards goal-directed therapy. We had targets for blood pressure and we aimed at those. The problem we're dealing with in trauma is the lethal triad. When you're increasing the pressure, you're popping the clot. Popping the clot is going to exacerbate hypothermia, it's going to exacerbate the metabolic acidosis, and it's going to exacerbate the coagulopathy. Those are three things you do not want to happen in your OR or in the ICU afterwards, and I don't want to happen in my emergency bay either. So what is damage control resuscitation? This is an anesthetic and resuscitative strategy that is used until definitive hemorrhage control can be obtained. That does not mean that this is something you should do extensively for a long period of time. This is the way you resuscitate someone until there's time for you to get into the abdomen and pack the bleeding or have someone put a cross clamp across the area that is currently bleeding. It is based on the same principles as damage control surgery. So as you know, in the past, it used to be emergency room, diagnose bleeding, send to the OR, and you would make everything pristine and perfect, and then someone would die. Nowadays, it's emergency room, they go to the OR, they get packed, they're sent to the ICU with a vac on an open abdomen. That's when goal-directed therapy is initiated. After they've had about 48 hours to stabilize, they're then brought back to the OR, the surgery is finished, and they return to the ICU. That's damage control surgery. We're bringing those principles to resuscitation. Simple way to think of it is you want to avoid anesthetizing the patient to death. Aiming to make hemodynamics perfect in someone who has a hole in something is going to kill them. It does not make them better. It does not lead to better outcomes. We have to remember that this resuscitation strategy is for use in trauma patients who are actively hemorrhaging. It is a small subset of our population, but it's a unique subset and they have a very different pathology.
aggressive fluid resuscitation will likely kill these people. I agree they're in shock. I agree we need to get the pressure to a place that's going to perfuse their brain. I don't agree we need to get the pressure to a place that's going to make them bleed out even more. You have to remember that this is not an endpoint. As soon as hemorrhage control is possibly achieved, it should be achieved. So I'm glad your answer was not bring this person to the CT scan. That's a small amount of blood. It was their hypotensive. They go to the OR. Now there are four pillars of damage control resuscitation. The first pillar is managing the airway and ventilation. These people are going for surgery. They're going to need to be intubated either by us in the eMERGE or in the OR at a very rapid point if they need to be on the table ready to be cut open. You need to control the bleeding. Controlling the bleeding in the resuscitation phase means you're keeping their, low, you're keeping their pressure low but maintaining a perfusing status, and we'll discuss that later. You want to preserve homeostasis. The idea there is you're not trying to increase coagulopathy, you're not trying to increase hypothermia. You want to give them the correct components at a correct rate. And finally, they need analgesia and sedation. Trauma is a painful experience to go through. He may be GCS 14, but he's just had a car land on him. He's not going to be too happy if you keep him awake. The only time to keep him awake, that stops him from dying. The objectives for this talk and what we're going to go over today First and foremost is what low blood pressure perfusing state is, and that's what's commonly referred to as permissive hypotension. If there is time, we'll talk about induction drugs in hypotensive patients. I understand that's not as much of a pressure for you guys. That's more prevalent to the emergency population, so we won't spend a lot of time on that. So the bulk of this talk is low blood pressure perfusing state. It's referred to as permissive hypotension. I don't want you to think of it that way. I want you to think of it as a way where the pressure is low, but you're still getting end organ perfusion. So where did this start? It originally started in the early 90s in rats and pigs, because that's where a lot of our literature starts. You would chop off a pig a rat's tail, or you would hemorrhage a pig's spleen, and would bring them down to a map of 20. You would then slowly resuscitate them to a very low map and see you survived, or you would quickly resuscitate them to a very high map. They found people who had a mean arterial pressure at 40, well pigs, so a mean arterial pressure of 40, survived longer and had less complications than those who were resuscitated to a map of 60, to a map of 80, to a map of 100. The reason they use pigs and rats is their maps are similar to our maps. So when I speak of the numbers, we're speaking in the same place. <coughs> Houston started doing this in people. The first trial, now refused to the Houston trial, was done in 1994. It was used for penetrating torso injuries. What they did was they decided someone had a penetrating torso injury and they had systolic blood pressure less than 90. They were randomized to two groups. Group one got fluids as per normal. Group two did not get fluids until they hit the door of the operating room. The only time they would get fluids if they were more bunned. That means that they had no pressure and were actively receiving resuscitation. These are the data, this is the data they got for penetrating trauma. Systolic blood pressure on arrival between the two groups did not differ. The group that was treated in the immediate range meant they got fluids anyways, did not increase their pressure. The systolic blood pressure when they got to the OR, again, the immediate group is getting fluids, the delayed is not getting fluids until they get through the doors of the OR. There is no difference. You can look at the pre-OR volume. 2.5 liters has been given to the immediate. 380 cc's have been given to the delayed. And again, that's because they were more bunned. You then look at survival to discharge. You have an 8% change in survival to discharge. There's further data on the coagulopathy. I'm going to talk about that more in some of the more recent trials that involve blunt trauma. But this is where it started. They looked at these people in a major urban center, Houston, that had largely penetrating trauma. So not our same patient population, but started us thinking maybe aggressive fluid resuscitation is killing these people. So what I'm talking about for you guys is we need to increase the threshold we have before we start fluids. We shouldn't say, oh my gosh, their map is 80, let's give them fluids. Oh my gosh, their map is 70, let's give them fluids. I'm saying hold back and wait. At the same point in time, you cannot forget that shock kills. This is a resuscitation strategy until you control the bleeding. You can't sit someone in the emergency room with a low pressure for 90 minutes for two hours and accept, expect a good outcome. It's not going to happen. There's been some research that has tried to say maybe delayed fluid is not good. This was published in 2001. It was done as a rebuttal to the Houston trial. Basically, this was done in rats again, and they looked at what happened if you give fluids early or if you give fluids late. If you look on to the right side, it shows early fluids versus delayed fluids. And yes, giving fluids early is better. This is because the, the rats were left with a map of 20 if you did not give fluids. If you look at all the graphs on the right side, the bottom one is mortality, so that's one that will make the most sense. The bottom line shows what they brought their map to. If you 
quickly bring someone's map to 40, they have less of a chance to dine than if you quickly bring someone's map to 80, and especially if you quickly bring someone's map to 100. Yet we all know a map of 40 is not the usual map. So although this shows you should give fluid right away, you need to be judicious with the amount of fluid you are going to be giving. So this started making more sense. We're now starting to look at it in blunt trauma plus penetrating trauma because blunt trauma increases more of a population. This is a retrospective trial that looked at 390 damage control laparotomies. As you can see from table one, it was done for people with high injury severity scores and people mainly of male sex. You can also see that this did include blunt mechanism of injury, 65% in the pre-damage control era and 69% in the post-damage control area. So getting much closer to our numbers. I agree we probably have more, blunt, more penetrating trauma, but still getting closer to our numbers. So what they were saying is if they apply damage control resuscitation principles, that means using small aliquots of fluid, normal saline in bowls is between 250 to 500 cc's, and using a map of 65 millimeters of mercury as their target to start transfusion and not transfusing once the map was higher than that. That was damage control principles. This is what they noticed. The systolic blood pressure between these two groups were pretty similar. The amount of crystalloid they got before the operating room was vastly different. It doubled in non-damage control resuscitation. The lactate after the operating room was massively different. You're doing 5.6 to 1.8. And that's even though you're giving large amount of fluids. If you look at evidence of the lethal triad, that's if they are coagulopathic by the INR, if they are hypothermic or they have any evidence of metabolic acidosis, you are doubling it. You look at the amount of fluid they receive in the first 24 hours. It's 13.9 liters versus 5 liters. The question then was, maybe this is a factor of using mass transfusion. So you look at how much blood these people got. You again are looking at 13 units versus 8 units. This is not just because we're using blood. This is because we're using volumes. Then what we really care about, are these people living? You look at 24-hour survival, 97% using damage control, 88% not using damage control. That is a statistically significant difference. You look at 30-day survival. Again, you still have a 10% difference. Again, it is statistically significant. Why are they thinking this happens? They think in the first 24-hour period, you're not having that lethal triad. These patients are not coming out coagulopathic. They're not leaking in the ICU. They're not requiring huge amounts of blood. So you're avoiding that complication. Over the next 30 days, you don't have the lung disease from massive transfusion. You have a lot less problems that come when someone has become coagulopathic or met any of the lethal triad parameters. So that's what they've seen retrospectively. We're now starting to look prospectively. Again, a trauma study being done in Houston. What they're looking at is how low can you go before you start transfusing? Right now, a map of 65 is what's being discussed in the trauma community from the East group because that's about 80% of someone's normal map. They are fairly comfortable using that in someone who has a head trauma, although they're not completely comfortable in traumatic brain injury yet. And literature and anesthesia has shown that a map of 50 during elective hip surgery has decreased blood loss and no increased death. So they're looking at a map of 65 versus a map of 50. This study excluded people over the age of 45 and under the age of 14. Luckily, that's most of our patient population is around the 20s to 30s. Young men tend to hurt themselves. They also excluded pregnant people, people with a history of MI, chronic renal failure, or CVD. So it's not an all-encompassing study, but does look at the healthy male population, which is the population that loves hurting themselves. Again, when you look at table one, you have a large group of males, a smaller group of females. They're in their 30s. That's what we're looking at. There are more Hispanic populations than we get in London, Ontario. That's because we're in London, Ontario. There is less blunt trauma, but there is still blunt trauma. This is preliminary results. They had to do this for a safety analysis because they were using a map of 50, which at this point in time was an unheard of map to use. So this was their safety analysis. As you can see by their Kaplan-Meier curve, they have not yet met statistically significant differences in mortality, but they are seeing a difference at the first 24 hours. What they're seeing is you're using significantly more blood products in the higher MAP group. You see people in the higher MAP group dying statistically more in the first 24 hours, and they tend to be coagulopathic deaths. So what this is saying to me at this point in time is if you use a higher MAP, you're not saving lives. This definitely shows there's no lives being saved, and you're probably increasing coagulopathy. This study is ongoing right now. 
Their final results are going to be done at 271 patients. I'm interested to see what their power is, especially seeing as they're starting to show mortality difference with the low MAP group already. It'll be interesting to see at the end. The other question that comes up is how much time do we have? When you read a lot of these trials, it's timed into the doors, emergency room to OR is 20 minutes. Working in the eMERGE, I rarely see that happen, unfortunately. And talking with some of the trauma leaders, they rarely see that happen as well. They see this takes a much longer time. Unfortunately, it's unethical to make someone bleed out and leave them in the emergency room to see how long it takes before they die. But we do have rats. And we're allowed to do that to rats because not enough people are in PETA, so that works quite well for us. So what was looked at was what's the ideal blood pressure to go at and how long can we do this? It was a fairly complex study. They did two steps. The first step was to determine the ideal MAP. So what they would do is do a splenic artery ligation to a MAP of 40, leave them there for 30 minutes, and then resuscitate them to a different MAP. After resuscitation, they would leave them at that MAP for an hour, and then they would control the site of bleeding and do goal-directed therapy. Doing that, they created the first table at the top, the number that survived and the MAP at which they survived at and how long they survived for. So maps between 50 to 60 had 8 out of 10 and 6 out of 10 surviving, and those that died still survived a longer time. Rats that were unresuscitated did not survive. Rats that were resuscitated and kept around 40, most of them died. Rats that were resuscitated to a map of 100, most of them died. They then took the group that got 50 to 60 and said, how long can we leave them that resuscitation period and then institute damage control and goal-directed therapy and get survival. So again, they would ligate the splenic artery, leave them for 30 minutes, resuscitate them to a map of between 50 to 60. They would leave them at that map of 50 to 60 for 60 minutes in group one, 90 minutes in group two, and 120 minutes in group three. As you'll notice, for 60 minutes, eight out of the 10 survived, and the ones that died lived an average of 440 minutes. If you did 90 minutes, 6 out of 10 survived. The ones that died lived an average of 340 minutes. There is no statistically significant difference between those two groups, but these are sample sizes of 10. Once you put this out to an hour and a half, I mean to two hours, 120 minutes, most of them are dying. What's this telling us? You can use damage control. It makes sense to use that. Less rats die at the 60 minute mark when you don't resuscitate them horribly aggressively. But if you leave them there too long, Shock will kill them because shock kills everyone eventually. And you have to remember that you need to fix the bleeding and institute goal-directed therapy. The other question that comes up in our center is what about traumatic brain injury? Because we deal with it. We deal with car crashes. We deal with people ejected from cars. That's the majority of the large destructive trauma we see in these 30-year-olds. We have to go back to basic principles. Cerebral perfusion pressure is your intracranial pressure minus your mean arterial pressure. So if you think, if I'm keeping my MAP low, I'm probably not perfusing the brain. This probably makes no sense in our population. These studies have not yet been done in humans, but it's an area of new research because it's now been finished in rats and pigs. Once it's been finished in rats and pigs, they're allowed to do it in humans, which is very nice. So this study was looked at closed head image injury and uncontrolled hemorrhage in rats. They would begin flu resuscitation after an hour after the initial head trauma, and they only used crystalloid in this study. After two hours of fluid resuscitation, they would then control for hemorrhage. They used three different groups. We're going to look at the groups that were given fluid. The other groups used phenylephrine. Phenylephrine was universally fatal. No animals survive when they use phenylephrine to artificially raise their blood pressure. It kills them, so if someone has a traumatic brain injury and is bleeding, do not reach for your pressors. It's not going to go out well for you. What they saw, if they gave no fluid and didn't have a target mean arterial pressure, you have 100% surviving to damage control, and you would have 73% surviving to 24 hours. They then looked at using a 3 to 1 ratio with no target map. You have 91% surviving, again 73% making it 24 hours. As they started targeting higher and higher maps, 70, 80, 90, less survived to 24 hours and less survived to discharge. This was then looked at at a basic science level, and what was noticed is when you give fluid to someone who's had traumatic brain injury, you are preferentially increasing the intracranial pressure. Because of the damage to the blood-brain barrier, fluid is leaking across. So when you increase the MAP, you increase the ICP greater. This has led to the belief that yes, damage control resuscitation can be used in traumatic brain injury populations. The studies are being started. They have not been finished in humans yet, 
So there's not a lot of literature to support this in human trials. There is literature in animal trials. And if you go back to basic principles, it makes sense. If you're increasing the amount of fluid in someone's brain and you're increasing their ICP, I don't care how high your MAP is. If every time your MAP goes up by one, your ICP goes up by two, you're not winning the battle. You're losing. So what's the goal I'm talking about here? The goal is a lower blood pressure until the bleeding is controlled. And how do we do it? We use blood. In London, we now have a massive transfusion protocol. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. And if you haven't, you will hear a lot about it. So I'm not going to spend time harping on it. If you look at the new ATLS guidelines coming out in the 9th edition, they are now limiting their bolus of fluid initially to one liter. It's not two liters anymore. They're coming down and down. Because we're seeing that normal saline does not tend to lead to increased outcomes because increased pressure does not make for a better patient. My advice and listening to the experts in the field is if you don't have any blood, use 250 cc aliquots of normal saline. Small little push boluses to help these patients get along. The other question comes, what if their pressure is too high? We brought them in, their MAP was 40, I've given them fluids, their MAP is now 100. You're probably blaming this on catecholamines or it's something you did. You're giving them pressors, you're giving them too much fluid. Right now, all the studies say we're using a target of one to start treatment, not a goal to keep it at. No one studied, if someone comes in on a MAP of 40, I raise it to 65, should I then walk the line there? You speak with some of the experts though when you listen to them, like Richard Dutton down in trauma, they speak about permissive hypotension with a low blood pressure perfusing states and you're trying to get rid of the catecholamine drive. To do that, they use an opioid and that is fentanyl and you give it in very small boluses. So what this means, you give them a unit of the blood, the pressure gets too high, the pressure becomes 75, 80, you're concerned they're going to pop the clot, you're concerned you're going to need to give more fluids and they're still vasoconstricted because they're in shock. Their catecholamines are sky high. You give them 25 to 50 micrograms of fentanyl, the pressure will come down and you will work in these small little sine wave type patterns until you have a good stable pressure. That will tell you that you know what? This patient's no longer vasoconstricted. They are perfusing their end organs and they are full of blood. They're not full of normal saline. So the diagram looks like this. You want to aim for a low blood pressure a map around 60. If they don't have that pressure, you give a unit of blood. If there is no blood in the eMERGE, because we do not keep blood in our emergency room right now, you give 250 cc's of saline and you recheck the pressure. If you're skyrocketing their BP, make sure you're not giving them pressors, make sure you're not giving them too much fluid, and you can think about giving fentanyl to open up their vasculature. That has not been studied either, but it is from expert opinions, and you'll see this done in some of the major trauma centers. What I want you to take home from this though, is shock kills patients. Just remember that. Shock kills patients. These people go into shock because they're bleeding out that needs to be fixed. In patients with uncontrolled hemorrhage, target a map between 50 to 60 until the hemorrhage is controlled. Increase your threshold. Don't walk in there and say, oh my gosh, the map is too low, I need to give something, because people can survive a pretty low map. You know you're doing well because the heart rate's less than 120, their acidosis is not increasing, and their pressure is not waving all over the place. And the last thing, hypotension does not mean dehydration. And that's why I speak about using opioids to help open up the vasculature. Because I do want these people to have blood products going in. I do want them perfusing their end organs. I don't want someone like a bad sepsis patient. I don't want it to be like sepsis resuscitated with only pressors. This is someone who needs fluid because they're losing it. They just need fluid after the bleeding is controlled. So take home points once again. Shock is going to kill them. Until they get to the OR though, you can't give them a whole bunch of fluids. They can survive this for likely up to 90 minutes is what our research is showing. Give them fluid as they need it. Do not use pressors to bring up their pressure. Before I go on to the next part, which is induction agents, are there any questions or comments about this? Just a quick one. Um, you keep speaking of blood products, but what are your ratios that you'd be uh, recommending. So I recommend we go by our massive transfusion protocol. I'm unsure of the one in London off the top of my head, although I do like the one to one to one that's being used in the States. I'm not sure what the ratio we use in the massive transfusion protocol in London is, but I advise we go by that. I'll just say go ahead. The, the ratio essentially is one to one to <coughs> two. Uh, here, the way the massive transfusion protocol is set up, you get your four units of uh, O negative or O positive, and then after that, you'll get a bucket that comes down with four units of blood, four units of FFP delay obviously with the FFP coming down has got to be uh, thought out. 
But once you order that, it'll continue to come. Every second bucket will have a, uh, a pool dose, an adult pool dose of platelets. Um, so it's kind of one to one to two. Um, but and it will only stop once. So you shouldn't ever have to stop the trauma transfusion pathway in the trauma bay unless you know you've activated it and they don't need it. But if they're continuing to bleed once they get up to the OR or to the ICU, it just keeps coming. It just keeps coming until it's stopped. Until we tell them to stop it, whoever is uh, running the trauma or the anesthesia, ICU, surgery. So it, it, it's, um, it's pretty good. We've published some data on it so far. And um, obviously too small to see really any difference in mortality. Um, but certainly do see a better use of our uh, transfusion. So we're actually using less products than we used to use before, and we're getting them to the patients more efficiently. So it's working. Sorry, yeah. Hey, Berg, I, uh, that's good. Good data you have. Uh, some of the some of the people that uh, and I and I think I think you're right. I think we should be using those maps uh, lower to probably have better outcome. I think it's a little bit, I think we have to be careful here about uh, the head injured patient, like you said, I don't think we have enough studies on that. So low maps with head injuries, I, I don't think we can quite compare to the rats yet. Um, I think the problem and some of the, some of the, the naysayers in the big trauma centers <coughs> basically say that the uh, permissive hypotension or the low map is a very difficult maneuver to perform in centers that don't do this very often. And to have uh, low volume centers trying to maintain lower mean arterial pressures where no other patient in their center is exposed to that is very, very difficult. And I would have to say that probably in London, you know, with the huge numbers of different eMERGE docs, with different trauma team leaders, with different anesthesiologists, with different uh, surgeons, with different residents, I think the the buying and the application of this is very difficult. Have you seen anything about how do, how do you apply this in a center? I mean, this is a center-wide phenomenon, and this patient is a completely different animal than any other patient in your center, and you're expecting everyone to be able to manage this at a, at a, at, at a different rate as every other patient. I think it's gonna be very difficult to do. From my understanding, that is also why they asked me to come speak at these rounds as well, because it is a group it's an entire center needs to buy into this if it's going to work. There's not been a lot of data on knowledge translation for this point alone, but from what I've looked at in the knowledge translation data for anything, be it a small center, big center, be it something as drastic as low mean pressures, we lag about 10 to 15 years behind the research. So I think that is a huge hurdle to overcome and it's a hurdle that presents dangers. It's a hurdle that presents dangers from someone not understanding when we ask for permissive hypotension. So it is, it is something that needs to be addressed, but at the same point in time, I don't think it can be a reason to not look to the best and newest evidence, especially in a center such as London, which is a trauma referral center and a teaching center and a research center. But I agree, it's a giant hurdle. Part of the problem, and the, as Bert said, part of the reason why we said, well, maybe this is a good forum to discuss this is because I don't think we have uniform practices when it comes to this type of patient, which is a very, very small, small, small subset of patients, right? It's the exsanguinating hemorrhagic shock patient. It's not the person that you give, you know, that has a small venous bleed and you give two units and their pressure comes up, everything's fine. It's a person that has got active arterial bleeding. So this is a very small subset of patients. And we've all been trained, including myself, to look at the, the BP monitor. And when you see 80, you start reflexively trying to get that up to 100. It's almost like a, a reflexive thing that we've been taught and we've learned over the years, especially from ATLS, two liters of saline, start giving blood, right? And the data for, for that, two liters of saline and uh, start giving blood and lower ratios is very weak based on two studies in the 70s. So I think part of coming here today is to say, hey, listen, a lot of the data, although a lot of it's in mirroring or rat physiology, um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, even the human data that we have, and we only have two randomized control trials in Bickle, and there's another one that uh, Dutton did at shock trauma. Um, we only have two actual prospective randomized control trials on that. Um, but a lot of the data seems to suggest that that's what we should probably be doing. And, but it's difficult, it's difficult. I mean, I clench my teeth, and I look at the, 
monitor and go, geez, I'm going to keep this pressure at, you know, map at 65. That's hard for me to do, right? But I think that, that may be what we need to think about in that very small subset of patients. And so that's what we're trying to do is to try to say, hey, you know, as a group, maybe we should consider uh, using this strategy in that subset of patients and that we all agree on it so that I'm not in the trauma bay and then somebody comes in from surgery and goes, Ram, what the hell are you doing with a map of 65? Are you crazy? And then somebody starts pounding fluid and the map's up to, up to 100, but we know that all the data suggests, a lot of the data suggests maybe we should be leaving that person until you get a hold of the person and stop the bleeding. Because that's really what we're talking about. You know, tolerating a map of 65, it's not a goal, it's toleration of that until somebody gets control of the bleeding, then you can resuscitate to normal parameters in the ICU. So I think that's part of the goal of today, to say, hey, maybe, you know, should we all be doing the same thing? And let's be uniform, maybe, with that, that subset of patients, so that somebody's not yelling at me when I'm resuscitating them. I think, uh, again, I think it was a very good talk, <clears throat> and certainly provoking. Um, and I think, actually, in the COTTEN trial, they there's a something in their methods that how they talk about they disseminated their education throughout their center and these are very highly specialized centers in the trauma programs they have you know they have their, their trauma surgery they have their trauma ER they streamline all the traumas into their uh, one side of their ER they have the trauma anesthesiologist so it's a, it's a bit of a different animal than it is say for us to be able to really institute this so there are a lot of challenges with that but I don't think they're insurmountable I think you, you, the big points are you, you've, you've highlighted them, and again, these are this isn't for everybody. These are for those you know three to five percent of patients that we're going to see that come in that need that come in hypotensive and need an operation. I don't see those a whole lot. I had a couple last week, but um, <clears throat> we don't see those a whole lot. And those are the patients that you can tolerate this map in. And again, bleeding patients need blood. They don't need crystalloid. So I would even say. You know when someone comes in and they're hypotensive, you can activate that trauma transfusion pathway right away. All you need is a little red top, boom. And then you can start your, your bolus of 250 or whatever, but bleeding patients need blood. So that's the other component of this damage control resuscitation is in all the studies, uh, the, the amount of crystalloid is significantly reduced. And that's a huge component to this coagulopathy, to the lung injury and everything. So I think that's very important that we need to remember. And it's, again, it's, uh, as, as uh, Ram said, it's, it's tolerating that pressure. You're not happy with it. Uh, it's difficult, but you need to tolerate that until, again, the surgical intervention can be done to actually stop the bleeding. I just wanted to speak to um, the ordering of the, of the massive transfusion protocol in the emergency department. Um, we have two orders, massive transfusion and trauma transfusion. And what I think you're talking about today is the trauma transfusion pathway. The massive transfusion is actually for um, bleeding in a non-traumatic patient. The two pathways are very different. The trauma transfusion pathway is what Neil was talking about. The pack of four red blood cells, then four fresh frozen, then two uh, platelets. But the massive transfusion, the nurses will be asking you to um, identify exactly how many units you want of each. And so um, in this type of scenario, if you can remember to order the trauma transfusion pathway, otherwise the, uh, the nurses will enter it um, erroneously and therefore they won't get um, the, uh, the allotted igloos um, of uh, blood products. And we also use the tranexamic acid as well. But yeah, that's, that's very, very important. It's one other thing too, Burke, is that, you know, I bet you even in our, those cases last week, I think you got to be careful that time. I bet you our stat OR trauma patients get there in about an hour at best. At best. So, you know, you're starting to get up where your poor rats started dying when you kept them at a map of 65. So, you know, I agree with everything that's been said. And, you know, we just got to try and keep it a little bit lower, but our OR stat time ain't, ain't no 20 minutes. Uh, that's true. Okay. A lot of those studies relied on, I mean, rapid transfer to the OR. So that's, so you can't necessarily translate that if, if the time's going to be longer. I'm not saying that it is necessarily, but if it is longer, then you have to be careful because leaving somebody at a map of 60 or 50 for an hour or something, that's, you know, that's where we get into the shock kill slide, right? So these, these centers all have dedicated ORs for trauma. So when I was at Grady, you had an OR 24-7, you just called up and said, yeah, we're doing a laparotomy, we're doing a thoracotomy, and that's all right. you had to say.
Well, one other thing then, uh, we are the referral center for trauma, trauma outside of London and transport times to London are significant and they probably range anywhere from an hour to more regardless of how far they are away just to transport someone and pack them up and move them it takes time. What do you recommend? I had a trauma just last week and um, actually was from Windsor and the merge doc said I'm basically going to resuscitate this guy to a map of 60 because he's been reading the papers and and so the philosophy was going to be well this guy's going to be with a mean arterial pressure of 60 until we in London operate on him and, and uh, stop the retroperitoneal hemorrhage that was going on. So I, I didn't recommend that for him. I think um, at that point you're sitting between a rock and a hard place. We yeah, know so, that. So what do you recommend for the guy that's in uh, Chatham or uh, Clinton that's bleeding from a spleen, fast as positive, pressure's uh, 80, MAP is <coughs> maybe 60 or 70, but it's going to be two hours. So what the evidence says is go by the acidosis. If, they are ma if they're one of our outliers who makes it to two hours and tolerates the low MAP and you have a way to check their acidosis, then tolerate the low MAP. Once their acidosis co starts coming up or starts going down if you're on by pH, then you have to resuscitate them further. But there is no hard and fast rule. And there's, there's accounts of physicians because it's been done in Australia where they have huge transport times by helicopters, two hours, three hours, six hours, trying to do this and getting into trouble because they're under resuscitating. So you have to look at your variables to look what the heart rate is doing, which is why I speak to a heart rate less than 120. If that heart rate's coming up and up and up, that's your other idea to look at because those heart rates should stay under 120. If that acidosis is getting worse, then you have to treat it. But you start, at, you start with your target, which would be 65, and go by what's happening with the heart rate if you can't even measure acidosis. Once the heart rate beats 120, then yes, you have to correct further. So I would say follow the heart rate at that point in time. I think that's the, it's an excellent point though that, that Daryl raises because <clears throat> that's you know I, 30 40 percent of what we will see and uh, there is no evidence to suggest that we can do this transport. all those papers are all direct to those specialized trauma centers and urban transports um, it's very difficult right <clears throat> so it, it is it's it's a bit of play but I can tell you that those physicians in those referring centers aren't going to be happy saying, well, you know, they don't have to measure, they can't measure acid, acid base status. I'm not going to just wait until the pressure, the heart rate gets to 121 um, before treating it. But again, blood products is more important in this scenario than every, every eMERGE has got at least two units of red cells. Um, to give them some blood rather than flood them with six or seven liters of crystalloid. So I think that's what's important as TTLs we should be telling. Um, our referring docs is that if someone's coming in, you got to give them blood, and you got to send the blood with them. Yeah. But I'd like to thank you very much for taking time and listening to me speak. Thank you.